Thank you very much. Um, two big ideas drive how large companies, or as the lawyers know them, corporations are run today. Shareholder value and stock market efficiency. And my challenge is to keep you awake while talking a little about the history and the current state of thinking of these two big ideas of uh, my generation. Firstly, though, I wanted to say that the corporation is a wonderful invention and doing very well, thank you very much. Um, some people describe it as an imaginary person that can enter into contracts with you and me and other corporations, and these can be enforced by the courts. If you and I have a business idea, um, we see an opportunity, we can get investors going on with their daily lives, usually, by the way, friends and family initially, to put a little money in, and they know by law, if we've set up a corporation, their liability is limited to that money. They don't, by the way, get any money back unless there's a surplus after everyone else is paid, and the other people being paid are usually the taxman at the head of the queue, workers, suppliers, and this surplus is known as profit. So that's the deal. Shareholders can put money in, they have limited liability, they can get some out too, but only if everybody else is being paid off. So popular are these imaginary people, these corporations, that their population in the UK is now some 3.4 million as of February this year. And on, of course, unlike real people, companies can't really be held responsible. It's hard to shake their hand or understand how they're feeling. They're a fiction. And as one English jurist complained in the 18th century, he said, corporations have neither bodies to be punished nor souls to be condemned. They therefore do what they like. So as a society, having allowed these imaginary people to come into existence, who are the real people responsible for their behavior? Well, the answer is straightforward almost in all jurisdictions. It's the directors of the company. And who appoints the directors? In most jurisdictions, it's the shareholders. And for large corporations, the ones that I know, who are these shareholders? Well, actually, in the main, they are other large organizations. The biggest in Europe is the Norwegian Oil Fund, which is the property of ordinary, if lucky, Norwegians. I say lucky because their oil fund is worth about 200,000 euros per head at this point in time for the more 4 million Norwegians. So they're the biggest equity holders or shareholders in Europe. Based in the UK, the two largest long-term owners are the university superannuation scheme, which is the pension fund of university employees, and the BT pension scheme, followed by the large insurers. But perhaps the biggest of all, if you put them together, are the pension funds of the state employees of the states of the United States of America, the firemen, the teachers, the civil servants, the municipal workers. So that's the system, as it were, today. Having been elected, what should directors have in mind as they guide these companies? Well, first and foremost, they need to know what's going on. And this is taking more time than many of them expected to spend. Too complex to understand is less and less an accept accepted as an excuse when things go wrong. Of course, we expect these directors to ensure that their charges obey the law in all they do. And further, it's reasonable to expect that they adhere to the norms of society. But obeying the law is a bit of a minimum. It's a low bar. How do we set things up so that directors guide their companies in society's best interest? After all, it's society at large that allows corporations to exist. Well, an answer was given by the famous moral philosopher Adam Smith. The answer he gave was his invisible hand. He said, that an owner, now he wasn't dealing with corporations all those centuries ago, he was dealing with entrepreneurs or merchants as he called them. An owner seeking his own profit in a competitive market serves society very well. The search for profit means he's not wasteful. Competition keeps him on his toes, preventing him from gouging his customers with high prices and forcing him to innovate, least to be overtaken by a more nimble competitor. It's as if he was guided by an invisible hand to serve us all well when really what he was after was more profit. Indeed, Smith felt that the entrepreneur did more good for society by looking after number one than by trying to do good for society. Here's what he said. He said, by pursuing his own interests, he frequently promotes that of society more effectually 
than when he really intends to promote it. I've never known much good done by those who affect trade for the public good. It's an affectation indeed, not very common amongst merchants, and very few words need be employed to dissuade them from it. Now, Smith was talking about real, not imaginary people. So what about our imaginary people, these corporations? Well, Milton Friedman and Michael Jensen in the 70s and 80s proposed that directors should run our vast enterprises, our corporations, to maximize shareholder value. So this is the, the first important idea that's driven managers in my generation. Shareholder value is not just today's profits, but all the profits you can see out into the future. The shareholders, they argue, are last to be paid, so maximizing their value maximizes value for society. Everyone else gets paid along the way. Competition and the search for profit are the regulators, much as in Adam Smith's time, that make these imaginary people seeking long-term profits serve us all. Professor Friedman argued, actually, that to do anything else would be profoundly negative for freedom. He said, imagine if a company started using company money that would otherwise go to shareholders to fund a social initiative that was not in some way in the interests of its shareholders and their investment in that company. Why, they would be taxing the shareholders, the BT pensioners, and enacting social policy that found favor with them. Do we want them to do this? Surely it's the role of politicians accountable to us all, not unelected managers and directors, to tax and decide where taxes should be spent. Of course, shareholders, once they've received their money, are quite entitled to espouse any cause and give their money to it, as are employees. But these imaginary persons and their guardians, the directors, need stricter guidelines when spending other people's money, Professor Friedman argued. Now, this doesn't prevent directors from, for instance, as Unilever does, espousing sustainability. Even beyond that required by current laws, if they judge it to be in the long-term interest of the company and its shareholders. Nor does it stop them from paying more than the absolute minimum amount of tax if they feel it will enhance the company's reputation and its long-term health. Or building extra capacity into their schools to serve the local community as well as their workers in African mining towns, which quite a few of them do. But they must be mindful that they're spending other people's money. Then, second question is, how do we measure these profits going out into the future? And that's the second big idea, if you like, that's come out of the economics uh, profession and that affects managers a lot. This other big idea is the idea of the efficient market theory, that the share price for a quoted company efficiently um, puts a value on all of those future profits that will accrue to shareholders. We've believed that, and as a result of it, to get our CEOs thinking about shareholder value, we've loaded them up with shares or options on shares. The problem is that there's quite a bit of evidence that the market's a bit short-termist. It's actually not so good at reflecting value way out, uh, way out into the future. And even if you disagree with that idea, there's plenty of evidence that the CEOs, the chief executive officers, and the directors believe the market is short-termist. So they behave accordingly. They may boost short-term profits at the expense of research and development, or indeed they may even take actions that damage the company's long-term reputation to maximize short-term value. Some argue that those who go out of their way to avoid paying tax are falling into this trap, hurting their reputation by not paying sufficient tax and putting, in a sense, mortgaging the future. So we're left with a, a bit of an intellectual vacuum, I would propose, in business. Maximizing long-term share of values is probably still has some legs. It seems a good guide for directors to guide companies in the interest of society. That's the purpose, guide these corporations in the interest of society. It's up to citizens then, at real, not imaginary, to spend money on social programs through the ballot box or through their own personal philanthropy, not for corporations to do it. But assuming that this long-term value is measured by short-term stock prices may be leading people badly astray. So what new measurement might they use? Well, there I have to tell you, the search is on, the debate is engaged, the answer won't be simple. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.